Hey folks, I am Kevin Ioli. I hope you are having a great day. I know I'm going to have a great day tomorrow because I'm going to be on the golf course. But today, <laughs> my privilege to talk to uh, my longtime friend, a guy I've covered a ton of his fights. And then since he's been a promoter, covered probably even more of his fights. The golden boy, Oscar De La Hoya. How are you, Oscar? Thank you, Kevin. Good, good. Good to see you. You were one of the few people I know that actually played golf with the President of the United States. Uh, good experience? Well, it, it, let's put it this way. It was a, it was a funny experience. Um, I've never seen somebody cheat so much in golf. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally putting golf balls uh, in their pants and falling off their, their, you know, their shoe. I mean, I've never seen that in my life. So you play, you play with me. So who cheated more, him or me? Uh, Kevin, you're, 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 you're a straight up guy. I mean, you, you don't cheat. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the, uh, the fights, Oscar. Just kidding around about golf. Um, UFC is coming back a week from Saturday. Uh, they're going to have three shows in eight days. Uh, do you anticipate Golden Boy uh, talking to DAZN and getting back, you know, in a similar time frame? Uh, what can we see you guys back going? I mean, I mean, talking about golf, um, you know, I was, I was, I was, uh, I was kind of like, I mean, I was actually very happy about the PGA of America announcing that they're, uh, I believe it's Colonial, uh, where they're going to come back and play without, I mean, obviously without the gallery, right. but um, that was, that was a, that was a big announcement for us uh, because now it, 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 it allows us to, to announce as as a promoter in boxing to uh to announce a fight you know without without being without being criticized without being ridiculed uh because we're just following the pga of america which is a huge entity in, in, in the in the sports world um my plan is to come back big with ryan garcia july 4th um which is a huge holiday for america so my idea was to give America, the fans, the, the world, uh, 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 a treat, okay? With Ryan Garcia in a great fight with Jorge Linares. So, Linares is still going to be the opponent. Okay, good. It would be an amazing fight. So, um, hopefully, and, and it all depends uh, with, with our mayor, with our, you know, with our, with our governor, uh, because obviously, as you know, safety is first. And that, I mean, that's the question that I have to ask, and you, you know, are in a great position as a promoter and a former fighter to answer this. I got to imagine it's going to be tough to fight in empty buildings because you especially were an emotional fighter and you, you seem to feed off the crowd when the crowd would start going. How do you think it's going to be when these guys are going at it and there's, you know, they can hear the other corner, they can maybe hear the TV announcers, but they don't have that crowd, you know, kind of spurring them on. Right, right. I, yeah, you, you hit it right on the, on the, on the nail's head, uh, Kevin. Um, I fed off the, uh, the emotions, for the crowd, and um, it, it, it revved me up. It gave me extra energy. The way I see it, I think it's, it's I mean, I'm not going to compare it to a sparring session, but when Ryan Garcia gets in the ring, he gives his all, mm -hmm. okay? Whether it's sparring, whether it's fighting. I don't, I don't think I see a difference with, uh, with uh, uh, I mean, being a factor, uh, having people or no people uh, in the arena. I, I, think, I, think, uh, I think professionals uh, like Ryan, like Canelo, like Jaime Munguia, uh, like uh, Virgil Ortiz, the fighters we have on our stable, um, are not going to be affected. So it, it all depends on the individual. It all depends on the fighters. It all depends what their state of mind is going up to the ring. But uh, I can tell you one thing. Um, when you step inside that ring and the bell rings, it's tunnel vision. It's focus. And it's, you're, you're there to win a fight. You're there to knock your opponent out. So hopefully it won't affect them. You know, I mean, I don't know if you would agree with this statement, talking about you as a fighter. Like, I've covered most of your pro fights. And, uh, you know, even though you were the biggest star in boxing for a period of time, I, I think as a fighter to a degree, you're underrated because, you know, you had Sugar Ray Leonard and Chavez before you, and you kind of had Mayweather, you know, sort of at the same time and then kind of after you. And as great a fighter as you were, you know, you were no more as a draw, but I, I don't know that people really knew how good inside the ring that you were. And, uh, you know, do, do you feel like, you know, you kind of, you know, you get the respect from, you know, how good of an actual boxer you were? I mean, look, I, I was, I was, one of the hardest workers, if not the hardest worker in, in, in what I did. I loved training. I loved 
waking up at four in the morning to run. I, I loved what I did. I started boxing at four years old. I won the gold medal. I won world titles. But no, you're right, Kevin. I mean, I don't know if it's because I, my looks, uh, because women followed me, because women, you know, uh, filled the arenas uh, more than men did. Right. Um, and it, it was always something on my back that I had to carry. And it, it weighed heavy, believe me. Poor guy. <laughs> I, I'm not complaining. <laughs> but, but, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, you know, if people, if people were to watch my fights now, today, and, and analyze and break it down, I was an okay fighter. I wasn't, I wasn't too shabby. <laughs> I, I, you know, actually, two weeks ago, ESPN had on two of your fights. They had uh, you against Chavez, your first fight, and, uh, and your fight with Trinidad. And, of course, you and I have talked about the Trinidad fight many times. But I want to ask you about that Chavez fight because there was so much pressure on you. You know, you were kind of the, the Mexican-American star coming up, but everybody was measured against the great Julio Cesar Chavez. And, you know, you had to beat him, but it was almost like a guy you idolized. Uh, when you look back on that, how big was that moment for you being able to not only win over him, but you stopped him and it, and it was a, a great performance on your part. Oh my gosh. I mean, Kevin, I had, I had uncles who were against me when I actually fought him. Really? I mean, they were telling me like, how can you beat our hero? Or, or, I mean, he's a king in Mexico. So you can imagine the, the pressure that I was feeling, you know, and put that aside. Think about, what people don't know actually that I'm telling you now as an exclusive right now, okay. the government in Mexico threatened me that if I were to wear a Mexican patch on my shorts, okay. Cause you know, I always wore the Mexican flag and the American flag. If I wore the Mexican patch on my shorts, they told me I would never be allowed into Mexico again. Wow. Yes. I have, I actually have the letter stamped by the president. Holy smoke. Of Mexico. And I mean, Put that aside, but the cartel, because of Chavez um, being such a huge draw in Mexico, the king, the cartel came to my training camp in Big Bear and threatened me that if I win, I mean, who knows what's going to happen. So imagine the pressure. I, I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was just, it was crazy. What was it like in the locker room that night? Because, you know, and once that you get to the locker room, it's just another fight. You're, you know, and you're getting ready for the fight. But you also know all this external stuff is going on. And on top of that, you're fighting, you know, who, in my opinion, is one of the 20 greatest fighters who ever lived. You know, I was so focused and, and determined. And I was, I was ready. I was, I was a machine that night. I mean, I, I, June, June of, what, 1996, Caesars right. Palace Outdoors, Don Cholain Rivero the great Mexican master. I mean, he gotcha. had the perfect game plan. My gosh, I was so focused, Kevin, so focused that nobody can beat me that night. Yeah, you were, you looked great that night. And now conversely, the next fight they show with you against Trinidad. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know if it pains you to watch that. And did you happen to watch it a couple weeks ago when it was on? You know what? I regret the last three rounds forever for the rest of my life. I mean, it, it pains me. It hurts me. It, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I felt I won the fight, but those last three rounds, I should have knocked them out. Right. Yeah. Somebody told me I was talking, and I don't even remember who I would tell you who it was, but after we were talking about your fight, and somebody said you had said you had injured your legs in training camp and you didn't have the legs to kind of fight those last three rounds. Is that what it was, or was it more Gil Clancy saying, you know, stay away, stay away, stay away? I mean, Gil Clancy, the whole night was telling me, box him, box him, box him. You have to fight one, box him. He hits hard. Don't get hit. Just box him. I have to listen to the master, Gil Clancy. Yeah, that was crazy. I mean, yeah. that really, I mean, I think I, I had you win in the fight, uh, but certainly I think that moment kind of, you know, knocked you down a little bit in your career, right? And oh, I think yeah. that was sort of. And, and then you follow that up with a loss to Shane Mosley in a, in a fight that was, you know, was a good fight. But the Vargas fight seemed to be the one that maybe uh, turned, it, you know, turned it back around for you because now there was such bad blood between you guys. And you know, anybody who thought you were a pretty boy and not a tough guy, I think, <laughs> found out in that Vargas fight that Oscar was pretty tough, too. I remember that first round. He almost knocked me out through the ropes. And it was a tough fight. Um, he hit like a mule. Oh my gosh. I felt his punches every time he would hit me. I mean, it, it, like I, I never felt anything like it, but I knew that 
my skill. I knew that my jab, my right hand that Mayweather Sr. had me work on, I knew that right hand was the key to beating Vargas. And uh, it actually worked. And, I mean, we, we came out successful, but it was that game that Mayweather Sr. had. He, uh, I remember he was mocking Fernando at the press conference, you know, it turned out Fernando was on steroids and, but he came out and he was unbelievably built and he, he looked like a bodybuilder in that fight. And I think Floyd senior in his poem called him want to be ferocious Fernando. And he, <laughs> he, he totally mocked him. But did he take some pressure off you by, you know, him kind of going after him and, and let you sort of stay, stay away from all that stuff. Yeah. Mayweather see, look, Mayweather senior, and I can say this honestly, was my best, I mean, my, he was my, tra the, the, the best trainer I ever had. Better than Emmanuel Stewart. Uh, uh, alongside of uh, uh, Don Chulain Rivera. Okay, wow. Okay? I mean, with all due respect to Emmanuel Stewart, but Mayweather Sr. is the best trainer I've ever had. One of the things, uh, I don't know if it's apocryphal or if it was a real story, there was a rumor that when you were in training camp in Big Bear for the Vargas fight that you were running and you ran into Fernando uh, and you guys came, came nose to nose. Uh, is that true? And if so, what happened when you saw each other? Yeah, it is true. I, I had my posse. He had his posse. It was, I mean, you think about or picture 20 guys with me and 20 guys with him. We ran into each other. We looked at each other and I looked at his face and his eyes and I saw fear and I knew I had him right there and then. Wow. Yeah. This was, like, this was about two months before the fight. And when you say you see fear, what is it you see in a guy when you're looking at him? I mean, did he kind of back away from you, or what was it that he did? Yeah, he, he didn't look into my eyes. Uh, and, and, and right there and then I felt, you know what, this guy's afraid of me. He is afraid of me. He, he has respect for me because he couldn't look into my eyes. So when you stop him in the fight, uh, is it more satisfying to get a win by stoppage in a fight like that where there was such emotion in the fight as opposed to decision? I would have loved to knock him out. Um, I mean, the referee, uh, I believe it was uh, the brave referee. Uh, was it Joe Cortez? Cortez? Yeah. Right? He hey, stopped the fight. But I would, I would have loved to knock him out. I mean, that's the biggest, best satisfaction that a fighter can have. Right. But uh, but it was a great it was a great stoppage. It was a great uh, victory. Um, I felt very uh, pleased, I guess, uh, with that with that fight. But I would have loved to knock him out. There's nothing like knocking somebody out and winning a fight. But when you have that referee come in and put his arm around the other guy and you know and everything, I mean, it's like okay, that that's got to be pretty good too, right? Because you see, he can't go on. I've I've kind of I've kind of made right. my point there. It's satisfying. It's oh my god, Kevin! It's so satisfying when, when the referee is protecting your opponent from you, and getting in between and intervening. It's the best feeling ever. I mean, it, it, there's nothing that can top that feeling. You, you know what I'm saying? Like when you're oh, of course. humbling somebody in the ropes, and there's nothing like it. It was kind of like when you and I and Eric Gomez played golf, and I saw you reaching in your pocket and handing those that money over. That's what it felt like to me. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that in Vegas, yes. That's really not true, but uh, <laughs> I, I, like, I like to. I know Oscar's a nice guy. He pretended like it was true. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I want to ask you one other thing about your fighting career. Uh, your fight with Mayweather, and uh, so today is as we record this uh, is the thirteenth anniversary of me being at Yahoo, and that was my first fight, De La Hoya Mayweather, uh, mm -hmm. that I covered when I was for Yahoo, and I remember it's, it's six rounds, thinking. Oscar's got a chance to win this fight. Right. And, you know, you were kind of looking like you were toward the end of your career. And, you know, I don't think it's a secret that you lived a hard lifestyle outside of the ring. And so oh, yeah. uh, your body was not, you know, the same as a, a typical guy your age would have been. Um, do you regret when you look, you talked about the Trinidad regret. You look back to Floyd and Floyd's now undefeated. He calls himself the best ever. It seemed to me that was a fight you could have won under certain circumstances. Do you feel like uh, that's when you let get away? Well, I mean, with Trinidad, for instance, um, I let it get away. I, because I was influenced by Gil Clancy. I, was, I boxed him. But with Mayweather, it was physical. I, I, after the seventh, eighth round, my body just broke down. It just broke down, like you said because of the wear and tear, all the, all the partying, all the, 
outside the ring. You know, I, I lived a hard life, Kevin. Right, I know. So it, it caught up to me. In the seventh, eighth, ninth round, they just caught up to me. And I mean, if I would have been obviously younger or, or in, in great shape, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I feel confident I could have beat him, but it just wasn't my night that night. I think, you know, when you, you know, you're a smart enough guy to know that being in that kind of condition and taking care of your body is part of being a fighter. And that's one thing you have to give him is that there was never a fight in his career he, that he wasn't in magnificent shape. And, and that's something that, you know, is very hard to do, as you know. His, his work ethic is, uh, is second to none. Uh, and that's what I respect about Mayweather uh, Jr. is that he works hard. He trains hard, he lives, breathes, and eats boxing. And, and, you know, that's what makes it great. Another guy who does that is Canelo Alvarez. Um, and I saw this morning, uh, and I was a little surprised to see this, a guy who I respect a lot, who I think is one of the greatest fighters who ever lived, and certainly one of the greatest of, of this uh, generation, Andre Ward. And he kind of, you know, I mean, he wasn't dogging Canelo, but I don't know if you saw the video where he said, that if you look at uh, Canelo's opponents, you know, he fought some names, but the guys he fought in his prime, you know, he lost to Mayweather and Triple G that he thought he, lo he, thought he had lost that fight to Triple G. And, and so he talked about a Billy Joe Saunders fight, uh, him needing to prove something against Billy Joe Saunders. When you hear a guy with as great eye as Andre Ward, the boxing knowledge of Andre Ward, say that about Canelo, what's your thought? Um, I mean, look, Andre Ward is a phenomenal fighter. Uh, in my eyes, obviously, he retired too soon. You know, I think in many people's eyes. Um, I have no clue why or where he's coming from. Um, I believe that Canelo is still improving. He's still getting better. He's still uh, growing as a fighter because take this into consideration that he didn't have an amateur career. Right. Andre Ward. Andre Ward was an Olympic, you know, uh, uh, an Olympian. So... I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, maybe, or who knows, maybe Andre Ward wants to make a comeback and maybe he's calling out Canelo. <laughs> you never know. I mean, strange things happen in boxing. So who knows? But uh, imagine that Canelo versus Andre Ward would be incredible. I want to ask you uh, your relationship with Canelo. Uh, Mike Coppinger wrote a big story before the last fight on The Athletic about, you know, Canelo and you guys weren't seeing eye to eye. Canelo seemed to confirm that. I know you didn't talk uh, to Mike for that story, but Canelo seemed to confirm it. At the press conference, it was pretty obvious you two weren't on the best of terms. Um, I know you don't have to be best friends to be able to promote each other and have successful relations, but... Um, what, how did you and Canelo kind of drift apart? And do you feel like this time away, ha have you worked at trying to repair whatever issues there were with uh, Canelo? It's all business, Kevin. I mean, look, in, in all these years that I've been in boxing, inside the ring and outside the ring, I've learned that it's all business. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in boxing, there is no loyalty. And it's, 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 it's sad, but that's what I've lived. Um, Canelo's a great fighter. I consider him my friend, but it's business. That's it. It's kind of weird. You've been on both sides of that because at one point you were Canelo and, and Bob Arum was you, and now you know it's kind of the other way around. Uh, so it's like you've seen it, seen it from both sides. Does that the fact that you've been on both sides of that kind of battle? Uh, you battle with the promoter, and you as the promoter, you battle with the fighter. Fighter, does that give you a different perspective? And, and have you learned how to, you know, I mean, are you going to change how you treat fighters in the future to try to avoid that kind of situation? I mean, you learn how to maneuver. You, you learn how to, I mean, you keep your guard up. That's basically it. I mean, me being a fighter, I know how to like protect myself. So it, 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 it I, I take that into my, my, my business uh, uh, life that I have now as a promoter. And, uh, and I use it to the best of my abilities. I mean, fighters are fighters. And you have to, you have to protect yourself at all times, just like, just like uh, Joe Cortez always said. <laughs> News broke a little you know, while ago that uh, DAZN wanted to put on, and you guys had agreed to put on a, a Gennady versus a Canelo 3 fight. Um, now it begs the question, with this whole pandemic coming down and when fans can be there, can you confirm number one that that will be the next fight, and then number two, for Canelo, and then number two, do you wait until you can have fans in there, or is there any way that you would put that fight on with no fans? Yeah, I mean, Kevin, I mean, obviously, uh, safety's first. You know, that's that's 
first and foremost. Um, we still have to figure out how do we make this work? I mean, because Canelo is the biggest star and attraction in boxing. Canelo Triple G has to happen. It has to happen. There's no, the zone wants it. We want it. Canelo wants it. Triple G wants it. It has to happen. That has to be the next or the first big major mega fight for boxing. That's how boxing uh, uh, makes a statement. You know what I'm saying? So, so you, need fan, you need fans there to do that fight, or can you do it without fans? I, I believe we can do it without fans, but but I mean, Canelo's a superstar. I mean, he's gonna want to have a, a packed arena. That's I a twenty five million dollar gate you're giving up if you do it with high. You know, and that's pretty tough. <laughs> It's, it, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, we have to put our heads together, I mean, minds together and really think this out because it's not, it's, it's, there's a lot of money involved with the gate. Um, I mean, imagine a fight of that magnitude with no fans. It's, uh, I don't, I, I, we've never lived this ever in our lives. So we have to figure this out. Let's uh, wrap it up here, Oscar. I appreciate your time so much. Uh, strange things happen in boxing and for the longest time the biggest enemies were Bob Arum and Al Heyman and then they put on the Wilder Fury fight and now they're talking about Crawford and Spence fighting and all of a sudden you see them coming together I think Al Heyman's big enemy on one hand was Bob Arum and on the other hand was Hugh and so now I wonder for Virgil Ortiz uh, as a guy they have a lot of fighters that would be attractive opponents for Virgil both Al Heyman and Bob Arum with, you know, you throw Crawford in that mix. Do you think you can work with those two promoters? Uh, and do you think it's realistic to think that you can get uh, Virgil Ortiz in with, you know, say the Danny Garcias and the Sean Porters, et cetera, to get into those big fights? Well, Kevin, I mean, look, and you know this best. I mean, we've always worked with everybody, whether it's Bob Arum, uh, Al Heyman, Don King, everybody. That's who we are. We want to make the best fights possible. That's it. Um, where there's money to be made, fights can be made. So, um, I, and Bob Arum and Al Heyman are the perfect example with, uh, with Wilder and, and Tyson Fury. So can these fights be made with, uh, with Virgil and, 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 uh, Terrence Crawford and, uh, you know, the best Walt Royce out there? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I believe that Bob Arum wants to make these fights. I believe that Al Heyman, I mean, he's a businessman. He's, he's a smart man. And where there's money to be made, we have to make these fights. Awesome. Well, Oscar, I appreciate it. And I promise you, next time you're in Vegas, I will not have any extra golf balls in my pocket. <laughs> that they fall out of my pants and I say, hey, I found my ball. <laughs> Kevin, always a pleasure. Thank you, huh?